I think my main interest here is to, first of all, find new uh, 4D n equals 1 backgrounds, and furthermore, find new, to, uh, new uh, dualities between 4D n equals 1 backgrounds. And I'm probably preaching to the converted here if I tell you that F-theory is a very, very rich and beautiful and nice and clean way to get 4D n equals 1 backgrounds. Uh, however, there's another class that might seem natural, and that is you start with M-theory in 11 dimensions, and you try to go to 4D n equals 1 from there. And if you want to do that, then you would ask for a real 7-dimensional manifold that has a Ritchie flat metric, that has a covariantly constant sphere, and such things exist. Uh, and it turns out that they have holonomy group G2 and are hence called G2 manifolds. The reason why people haven't studied this like crazy is that uh, these things are really difficult to, to make, especially in contrast to Calabiao manifolds, where we have all of our favorite algebraic geometry tools, we have Yao's theorem, and we can make millions and millions of examples. And that has not been the case for G2 manifolds. And, uh, well, one of the things that you can learn from, uh, from studying uh, these things and n equals one backgrounds is also how to how to alleviate this fact and how to learn more about how to make new examples and then go back and learn something about about physics from that. So the the strategy for how I will go about connecting F theory on some nice class of Calabi-Yau fourfolds to M theory on G two manifolds as follows. So I want to use the the if you like the logic of fiberwise duality. And that's, of course, something that is very well known to people working in F-theory, because that's how the duality between F-theory on some Calabi-O fourfold and heterotic string theory on some Calabi-O threefold works. Namely, because uh, F-theory is some specific limit of M-theory, uh, heterotic string theory on T3 is the same as M-theory on a K surface. You can, um, you can uh, split this T3 into elliptic curve times an S1, uh, the elliptic curve is the elliptic fiber of some uh, threefold that gets replaced by a K surface if you want to go to F theory, and then you just take the limit where this, if you like, spectator S1 uh, magnifies. However, if we are working with erotic string on a Calabi-L threefold, then that Calabi-L threefold will, at least in a specific limit in its moduli space, it will have a second vibration. Uh, and that vibration is what is called the strominger yau sassoff vibration. And this is something that people studied in the context of mirror symmetry. And the point there is that uh, Calabi-O threefolds can be fibered by a three torus over a three sphere. And then we can try to understand that well enough so we can work out what the dual M theory geometry is. So this is what I will do in my talk. So this is something that this idea has been around since the 90s, I guess. But until very recently, the only examples that people had of this logic was essentially orbifolds, yeah, but now we can do much more, and we can, and I will show you a class of, uh, of, of examples where we can actually pull this off explicitly and check at the end of the day that a few things that should work do actually work. So let me start with the, on a very particular example of a Calabi-O fourfold that is written like this. So here is that one, two, one uh, and two hat are homogeneous coordinates on some P1 times P1, and then I write this complete intersection thing. So that gives me two the curves, and the thing I get end, uh, ends up looking like this. So because I only have half an hour, I, I will try to convene many ideas by drawing curves instead of writing down all the mathematics because that would take much too long. So here are the two uh, P1s that are uh, parametrized by Z and Z hat, and then I write these two elliptic curves fibered over that by uh, adjusting those polynomials, and what I end up with is that one elliptic curve, this one, is only fibered over the Z hat P1 such that it generates over 12 points because I give degree four and six here, and this guy here um, is given by the first equation, and that has and the discriminant of that has degree 12 here and degree 24 here. And in particular, in doing F theory, ah, sorry. First of all, because this thing is only fibered over this elliptic curve is only fibered over this P1, this thing here gives me a DP9 or a rational elliptic surface. And now, if I want to do, uh, for, doing, for the purpose of doing F-theory on this Calabio forefoot, what I want to do is I want to select this elliptic curve as, the elliptic, as defining the elliptic vibration uh, 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 that specifies my F-theory model. And if I do that, then the base is clearly DP9 times P1. 
So once I know that, uh, I can just go and I can work out the Hodge numbers of this fourfold, and then I know what the spectrum is. Furthermore, if I know the Hodge numbers, I know what is the other characteristic. It's 288, so I need to include, uh, if I don't switch on any flux, which, I, which I'm not going to do, I'm going to need to put 12D3 brains. Uh, and now, uh, once I know that, I can just work out how many 40N equals 1 uh, U1 vectors I get and how many uncharged chiral multiplets I get. And it turns out that I get 12 and 299. Note that this number includes this sum here, which is the moduli of the D3 brains moving around in the geometry. Furthermore, note that these models in general have non-perturbative corrections to the superpotential, and I'm assuming that I, that I can safely neglect these by going to a large volume where they are suppressed. Okay, so um, now furthermore, if, if I come back to the uh, before, I can also think about this fourfold as a key surface composed of this elliptic curve over this P1 fibered over DP9. Yeah, so once I, once I see that, I immediately know how I have to build my heterotic dual. Namely, what all I have to do is essentially delete this P1 from the Yeah, I replace this key surface by an elliptic curve fibered over DP9 such that I get a Calabial threefold. And that's the first thing I want to do. So once I do that, the threefold I end up with looks like that. It's very simple again. It's just a product of elliptic curves fibered over a P1 such that each one of them degenerates over 12. Uh, again, I can write this as a complete intersection if I want, and it's going to look like this. And it turns out that there's a very, actually a very famous uh, manifold that's something called the schoen calabial threefold. And you can also realize this as a complete intersection in projective spaces, and then you might want to call it the split by cubic. And its Hodge numbers are 1919. Uh, the heterotic dual of F theory, of the F theory model we considered first, uh, is now given by a specific vector bundle on this thing, um, and because the, on the F side the uh, base was D, uh, DP9 times P1, the instanton numbers of these bundles are equal, and they're both equal to six times the class of one of the two elliptic fibers. Remember, these things are called E and E hat. Um, and um, the second term class can be written like this. These two bundles only kill off this part, and this I need to cancel with NS5 brains. So I need to wrap 12 brains on them, and of course, these are nothing but the duals of the brains we had in F theory. Again, I can sit down and I can just work out how many moduli, how many, you get 12 vectors from the NS5 brains because they're wrapped on elliptic curves. The dilaton gives me this, the geometry gives me that, this is the bundle moduli, and these are the moduli of the NS5 brains moving around, and of course, they end up with the same number as 12 on 299. All right, so now uh, we have F theory and we have heterotic string, and now we want to go to try to see how we can uh, map that to M theory on a G2 manifold. And as I said, the strategy will be find the um, SYZ fiber, the Strominger Yaroslav T3 fiber of this thing, and replace it by a K3 series. And to do that, I first tell you what that looks like. And there's a very neat way to, to figure it out for this geometry to figure out what the strominger yau sasloff vibration looks like. And the way this goes is as follows. So what I want to do first is I want to assume that you take this base P1 and you, you stretch it very, very long. And not only do you stretch it, but you also uh, put the... Uh, you remember that each of these two elliptic curves degenerates over 12 points. Um, I want to separate these. I want to put the 12 generation points of E on the left-hand side, and E had just a product and the 12th generation points of E hat I put on the right-hand side, and now E is just a product here. And, uh, well, once I've done that, I can, I mean, for the moment, just forget about the right side and just cut it in half. And if I do that, it looks like this. And uh, you will see now that, well, this elliptic curve here is now fibered over, over C, if you like, a, a cigar. And that thing looks like, again, like a rational elliptic surface with one point in its base and the fiber over it. And that thing is a product with uh, elliptic curve E hat. Now, one thing to note about the strominger yaus hasloff fiber is that uh, it is uh, what is called Lagrangian, so it's calibrated. Um, and you can think about it in local holomorphic coordinates in such a way that it's in the purely real directions of those holomorphic coordinates. Yeah, so, uh, and I know roughly, at least, I mean, maybe back here, it, things might become more complicated. Well, actually, not so much, but uh, let me focus on this asymptotic region here. Oh, oops, on this asymptotic region here, 
where um, this whole thing essentially looks like uh, an interval and five copies of a circle. And I know, of course, that this thing here is C, it's holomorphic, these are elliptic curves, so I can uh, about uh, one holomorphic coordinate here, one here, and one here. And now the thing that I want to identify, the, the, the three circles I want to identify with the stromage Sasslo fiber are in the one, three, five direction. So it's that one, that one, and unfortunately that one down here. So that doesn't tell me much about what this vibration looks like. However, it turns out that this thing here, a rational elliptic surface, with a uh, one T2 fiber excised, is actually a hyperkähler manifold. Yeah, rational elliptic surfaces are not hyperkähler manifolds, but this thing is. One way to see that is to note that it's just half a key surface that have, have cut in half. And if I do a hyperkähler rotation, what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to swap which of those asymptotic circles I call which, and I end up with something that looks like this after the hyperkähler. And then I'm going to say, ah, great. So now, the 1, 3, 5, the, the, the real directions that I want to identify with my SYZ fiber, uh, I can now see how they are fibered. Namely, here I have just a copy of C, here I have an S1 that is just a product, here I have an S1 that is a product, and here I have something that is non-trivially fibered. So to just draw the picture differently, and the, the, the other stuff is the base, to draw the picture differently, I, 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 would, I would put something like this. Uh, so... Uh, it is a T3 fibration over a product of C uh, with S1, but actually the only stuff that is non-trivially fibered is an elliptic curve over C, and the rest just goes along for the right. Very, very easy. But now remember that I had Pune to labial threefold and I cut it in half, and this is only one half. And now I repeat the exercise for the other half, I get the same thing, but now which of these S1s in the middle I call which, that has changed. I just wrote the labels for you here that you will get if you do this exercise. So now, of course, uh, when I glue it back together, the way the identifications work are like this. I hope this doesn't look too complicated right now, but essentially what I'm doing is that this S1 goes to, uh, this S1 that varies non-trivially here goes to the same thing on the right side, but this is swapped here with the trivial one, vice versa, and in the base here as well. So first of all, that will tell you, ah, so these identifications nicely work in such a way that they preserve what I call the fiber and what I call the base. So that looks like it defines for me globally a fibration. Furthermore, if you think a little bit about what that thing here is, it's two soli tori that are glued together in such a way as to form an S3. It's actually a T3 fibration over S3. So once I tell you that, and we have this nice picture of the Strominger Yao Sassler vibration, one of the things you might ask about is, okay, uh, what about its discriminant locus? Yeah, so these things will have a discriminant locus as do elliptic vibrations, and this is the locus where the fiber degenerates. We can just immediately see that because, well, here, this torus degenerates over 12 points, but I have this product as one hanging around. So I get 12 copies of this as one label two from the left-hand side, Similarly, I get 12 copies of this S2, labeled 4, from the right-hand side. So we get 24 copies of S1. But because this thing is mapped here, when I stick it together, these uh, things have a non-trivial linked number, and the whole thing is going to look like that. So 12 plus 12 linked copies of S1s. And it turns out that both Gross and Morrison and Plesser have considered the same model, and with completely different methods using toric geometry, uh, worked out that that is what the discriminant of the Stromenjayao's Hasler vibration of the schoen calabial threefold looks like. So now we're in good shape, and uh, what we want to do is we want to replace the, uh, the T3 fiber of this by a K3 surface. And to explain to you how that works, we have to understand a little bit better uh, what are the details of this, uh, of this duality. Namely, um, on the heterotic side, uh, on T3, what I have to specify is, of course, the metric and the B field and the uh, flat E8 plus uh, times E8 vector bundle on T3, which is given in terms of uh, some Wilson lines. And for M theory on the surface, uh, it's mostly uh, it's geometry. So uh, I have to think about what is the moduli space of Ritchie-Flat metrics on the surface. It turns out that that is given by looking at the, uh, that the form and the real and imaginary parts of the holomorphic to zero form of the surface, and just working out all of the periods of that over the middle cohomology. 
And the middle cohomology contains a lattice, and that lattice looks like that. It has three uh, summons of the hyperbolic lattice, which is a two-dimensional lattice, and two copies uh, of the E8 root lattice. And it turns out that the periods of, of these three differential forms over, over these summons tell you about the metric and the B-field, and the periods over the two uh, the the eight lattices tell you about the Wilson lines. And now, uh, we don't just want to do that for a single T3 and a single K3, but we want to understand how that works in the specific fibration I was discussing. And now the crucial, crucial trick is the following. So on the heterotic side, each half of this Schoenkalabiol threefold looked like a T3 fibration over something that looked like a copy of C times an S1. And of course, we want to replace that on the M-theory side by a surface that I call S, uh, fibered over C times S1, such that the whole thing makes something that I call X times S1, right? This product S1 will clearly just go along for the ride. Now, crucially, on each half, actually, it was not the case that the whole T3 fiber was varying non-trivially, as you might remember, but because it came from this special elliptic surface with a point excised, only a T2 in the T3 was varying non-trivially over the base. And that translates on the M-theory side to not all forms do something non-trivial, but only two of them do something non-trivial on each side. And the nice thing that you can do then is you can say, ah, I can take this X, this uh, this manifold X that I get by replacing that I get from replacing the T3 fiber by a K3 in these non compact I can I can choose these to be algebraic threefolds because if you have an algebraic threefold that is fibered by K3 surfaces, then the Kähler form will be constant, and the holomorphic to zero form will vary in a non-trivial way. Yeah? And I, because the the Kähler form sits in the Picard lattice of the K3 surface, uh, and the holomorphic to zero form sits in the transcendental lattice. Uh, and I identify each of these uh, hyperbolic lattices as one of the S1s, I want to make sure that the Picard lattice at least contains one of the, uh, these summons and the transcendental lattice contains the two other ones. And, well, one of the things that uh, uh, you might know is that if you have a K3 surface and the Picard lattice contains one summon like that, the surface is a little fibered. Um, so here's the picture again. Yeah? Remember, two S1s do something non-trivial. One S1 just sits there. So that's the one we want to identify with the K form, and these are the ones we want to identify with the holomorphic to zero form. And if we make this uh, by replacing this T3 with a K3 surface, and if we do that, what we end up is that looks like that. So this thing here, the S fibered over this thing here is algebraic. This thing fibered over this is algebraic. We stick it together in such a way, and then the map that you want to apply between those two surfaces in the middle is actually what is called a hyperkähler rotation. And that's very nice because that changes the complex structure between those two K3 surfaces, but it preserves the Ritchie flat metric, which is a nice thing. In particular, note that uh, if we wanted to end up with a non-trivial thing like a G2 manifold, we have to destroy holomorphicity, if you like. And that's precisely what happens. Here. There's a construction that has been discussed in mathematics in the last years where people have used precisely this, uh, this way of making uh, G2 manifolds, which are called twisted connected sum G2 manifolds. And it's not difficult to prove that then if you do, if you, if you have this kind of setup, you actually end up with something that has the full holonomy of G2. So to be slightly more precise, say a few more things, uh, the way this goes is you take two algebraic threefolds, fibered over C, um, uh, then you take each of these times S1, you stick them together as shown in the, in the, in the picture uh, before, uh, the surfaces undergo a hyperkähler rotation, uh, and then uh, it turns out that you have to choose x and x hat in such a way that you that they are Calabiano threefolds, so they have Ritchie flat matrix, and then the resulting G2 manifold will also have a Ritchie flat matrix that is in a sense close to the Ritchie flat matrix on these Calabiano manifolds. Um, and uh, as a remark, uh, these things you can construct very easily uh, from something compact, namely you just make a compact algebraic threefold that is prefibered over CP1 but that is not Calabi-Yau, but the first churn class is the same as the class of the fiber, then you excise a point, and what you get is one of those asymptotically cylindrical Calabi-Yau threefolds. And the nice thing about that is these are very, very easy to make. So you can go back to the mathematics literature to see how that goes. It's a very nice paper by Jim and Dave where they discussed it at great length, and they also wrote a paper two years ago where, uh, well, essentially, if you know your toric geometry to make Calabi-Yau manifolds, 
use the same toolkit to make uh, algebraic three folds that, then you excise a point, you glue them, and you get G2 manifolds. All right, so, so far I've just essentially spoken about the heterotic geometry, but remember that on the heterotic side we also had a bundle. And the way the bundle worked, because it came from F-theory, from the F-theory data, uh, you should think about this bundle as uh, corresponding to some kind of non-trivial Wilson lines on this the curve that vary non-trivially on this half. In other words, we get something like a spectral curve. But on this side, the elliptic curve E that I used to go to F-theory is, is just a product. So also the Wilson lines will be constant and there's no non-trivial gauge bundle data encoded on the right-hand side. But it's only contained in the left-hand side. Uh, well, now I remember what we did. We did this relabeling to find this kind of shape, and then we did this replacement. And now what we want to have is we want to have all of the bundle data for this half and nothing here. And having non-trivial bundle data here means we've got to have one of those two forms that give me the metric sitting inside of the E8 lattices and varying non-trivially. And that means we have to stick them in the transcendental lattice because that's where the holomorphic to zero form sits that varies non-trivially here. And then you want to make this change. And then you can find out, then you can find algebraic threefolds that over C that uh, with this kind of choice for K3 surfaces, that's not hard to do. Similarly, on the right-hand side, uh, we want to stick these E8 lattices in the Picard lattice because that means the Kähler form will have non-zero periods over that. And that means you essentially have constant Wilson lines on the right-hand side. So once that is all said and done, you, you work out these three folds, you compute uh, what they look like topologically, then you stick these things together, so you do a little bit of algebraic topology, and you work out the, 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 what, what, what's happening, and what you end up with is a, is a, is a, is a manifold, a seven-dimensional manifold, of course, that has second Betty number 12 and third Betty number 299, which is very pretty, because these are precisely the numbers of the vectors, and the U1 vectors, and the number of the uncharged chirals we had in dual F and uh, F theory and heterotic models. And of course, if you have M theory on a G2 manifold, you, these numbers precisely count the spectrum for you. Here you, you, you get it from the three form and M theory, and here you get one real degree of freedom from the three form, and the complexification is provided by uh, uh, deformations of the metric that keep, the, uh, that, that keep it Ritchie flat. So, well, once we have that, I mean, that was now one particular model where we went all the way. It's actually quite easy to, to extend this and to make a lot more examples if you want it. Namely, you might want to twist the story. So remember that in the, in the example I showed on the, one of the first slides, we took these two P1s to be a product. But as you know, if I now take this one here and I fiber it non-trivially, like so to get a surface over that one, uh, what that will mean in heterotic is that I will have a different of the distribution of the instanton numbers. Maybe the n here will translate to this thing being 6 minus n e hat and 6 plus n e hat. Uh, and, um, well, now you can do that, you can work it out, you can go all the way again to, to the m theory. And uh, something that you find on both sides is that when n is bigger or equal to 2, you actually enforce a non-hixable gauge group. And the same happens on the G2 side. It's a, it's a very, very pretty thing. And the way this works is quite similar to f theory, namely, uh, in, in this context here, the, the way the non-hexable gauge groups work in F is that this K3 fiber is singular, has an ADE singularity everywhere over this DP9 base. Similarly, uh, for this G2 manifold, this K3 fiber S is singular with an ADE singularity everywhere over this S3 base. Uh, now, in F3, the way the non hexability comes about is that you can only resolve the fourfold, and that's not physical in F theory. So there's nothing you can do. Here, of course, resolving, deforming, these things are all physical because you're not working in the limit where you want to shrink the fiber. However, uh, whatever you do, you got to preserve this Kähler rotation. And that swaps the Kähler form with the real part of the holomorphic to zero form. That means resolving on one side mean, is the same as deforming on the other side. Now for these uh, n bigger equal to two cases, it turns out that to make this thing smooth, you would have to resolve this and resolve this, and you can't deform S, uh, you can't deform this half, you also can't deform this half. So you're stuck with the singularity. That's the slightly clever way in which uh, this G2 manifold uh, uh, sees this non hexability Of course, you can also work out that you have no matter, and that hence, there is n physically, there is no way to hex it. And in fact, uh, what is very nice is 
uh, I can also discuss uh, Hixable uh, gauge groups and, and matter and all of these things. But and as long as I'm working in the class of that are close enough to this fourfold I started with, where I have a K3 vibration over DP9, I can tell you what is the dual, uh, how the dual G2 manifold is constructed, I, which K3 surface you have to choose and how you have to fiber them. And then I can prove in general that the light spectrum uh, is the same, which is quite remarkable. Note, however, that uh, these models have no chiral matter. So in F theory, you can work it out directly that you don't get chiral matter. And in M theory, what you would need for chiral matter are point-like singularities. And because each of these halves here always has this as one factor hanging around, there is no way you're going to get that. All right, so in the last uh, three, four minutes, uh, let me mention something else that is nice uh, and ask the question, so why did these authors care about these uh, uh, this specific Calabio fourfold and this specific Calabio threefold I, I spoke about. The reason is that uh, this fourfold here has infinitely many rigid divisors, and this, uh, this fourfold and this threefold has infinitely many rigid curves. And that means if I look at F on that one or heterotic on this one, I get some uh, non perturbative superpotential here from M5 brains and here from world sheet instantons. And um, well, these things should map. To, uh, there should be a corresponding correction on the G2 side. And on the G2 side, I get that from having M2 brain instantons on so called associative submanifolds. So these are supersymmetric three cycles of a G2 manifold. And um, uh, it turns out that you can use this uh, uh, chain of dualities that I have, have, have shown you, and you can actually find these associative submanifolds and you can say what they are. And that's, 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 a, that's a very, very pretty thing but in a fairly non-trivial statement about these G2 manifolds. And uh, actually, there's two ways in which you can do it. You can either do it, um, so these two things are upcoming, you can either do it in the way that I explained to you just now, or you can also, and that's going to be in the second paper, you can also go uh, from F to type to B in the weak coupling limit, do T duality to T to A, and then uplift that again to M3. And very satisfyingly, what you find is the same associative submanifolds in both approaches. And even... Uh, prettier, uh, if you study mirror symmetry for G2 manifolds, you get the conclusion that at least the models I've been discussing are actually fibered by, by four tori, and uh, these vibrations can have sections that have the topology of S3, and uh, it turns out that these submanifolds, you can characterize them as being sections of this vibration. All right, so uh, let me uh, finish. So the message that I tried to convene here was that if you know explicitly how to pull off duality between heterotic strings and F3, you actually also, using essentially the same ideas, can work out, at least for these twisted connected sum G2 manifolds, how the duality between M theory on G2 and heterotic string works. And of course, the crucial trick was that this strominger yau saslov vibration of this L3 fold we had, uh, on each half in which we could cut it, uh, only had a T2 that was varying non trivially. So the, the flavor of this was like heterotic F theoryality in six dimensions, done twice and then non trivially combined. And what's very pretty is that uh, everything has become geometry. So remember, we had the three brains on heterotic, uh, uh, the three brains in F theory. On the heterotic side, these become NS5 brains. Huh? But once we go to the G2 manifold, all of the NS5 brains are geometrized. So also that means we have a geometric version of the D3 brains. And it essentially looks very similar to how you would capture NS5 brains that are purely in the base, like the ones Fabian spoke about. It's the same, this, almost the same story. Uh, and uh, yeah, quite satisfyingly, you do all of this geometric gymnastics, and at the end of the day, you can work out uh, that, uh, that, that uh, you have a dual compactity that pass the first order test of having the same light spectra. And uh, one of the nice things about this, slightly generalizing what, what I do now, is that you can use these dualities to make quite non-trivial statements about G2 geometry. And uh, at that. Um, and I didn't know I would make that. Anyway, um, and uh, for physicists, even more interestingly, once you have a solid grasp of what you can do with these G2 manifolds, you can use that to make some quite non-trivial statements about physics. So, because I didn't go over time too badly, let me just spend 10 seconds to, to say one thing. Uh, Look at your phone, not me. 
okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, these M5 brain instantons that give you the non-perturbative split potential for this Calabio fourfold I started with, these contributions can go to zero. Because you have these D3 brains, you can take a D3 brain, put it on this um, divisor, and then there's some kind of Gano string that becomes massless, you get an extra zero mode, and the instanton doesn't contribute anymore. As I told you, on the G2 manifold, the D3 brains have become geometry. Yeah? And then you can see how in the geometry the D3 brains mess up, or the, the, the corresponding uh, somehow effect in the geometry uh, will mess up uh, these associative three manifolds that you can construct. Which is a very different picture on the same thing, and you don't have to speak about D3 brains and strings and such things anymore. It's all in the geometry. All right, <coughs> let me stop here and say thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any questions for Andres? Ron? Uh, I got a little confused in the beginning. Oh, thank you. Uh, early on, you, was, you pointed out that you need special Lagrangian cycles. Yes. Um, but the, the, the T3s that you wrote there, I, I, it, it seems like in general they would be complex, so you can't really consistently talk about the no. real part, unless you take the branch points, the 12 points and the 12 points, all to, be, to have real coordinates. But then I get confused about your, your parameter count. I see. Well, so I think if, if I wanted to make a more somehow rig rigorous uh, argument for that, what I would say is the following. I have dp9 times t2. And of course, the dp9 is elliptically fibered, so the... the uh, the, the, the elliptic fiber is, 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 uh, yeah, is, is, is complex, no? Yeah. But now I can do a hyperkähler rotation, and then I get a special Lagrangian fibration by a two-torus on this open DP9. Because that's what the hyperkähler rotation does for you. And then I can, and, 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 now, and now that thing, uh, and then I had a product with a further T2. So that means there is a special Lagrangian T3 fibration on DP9 times T2. And now if I stretch things very long in a specific limit, I will be able to glue these things together and then I get globally a T3 fibration. So this hyperkähler rotation is a crucial point. Because that takes you, I mean, in the same way as you would, if you would have a K3 surface, right? You would have an elliptic fibration on a K3 surface, you do a hyperkähler rotation, the elliptic fibration becomes a special Lagrangian fibration. It is the same trick. So this is not like the, the work of Morrison and Wal Walsher where they really need everything to be defined over the reals, and they take the, the cycle of real points and there to be the special Lagrangian. This is, well, sounds I mean, like this is no, different. No, I think the point is really that if you have a hyperkähler K3 surface or hyperkähler, this, this open DP9, yeah? if you do a hyperkähler rotation, the elliptic fiber becomes a special Lagrangian fiber. I mean, that's all the information I need, really. And then I, and then, and then I have a special Lagrangian fibered uh, a real four-dimensional manifold times a T3, and that's a special Lagrangian T3 fibration. And then, of course, sure, I mean, and then, of course, you want to argue about, okay, fine. So now you have two of those, you stick them together, can you do that consistently? And indeed, you have to work in a specific limit. So also, in this construction of T2 manifolds, you have to make this next that you glue long enough to be able to prove that there is a Ritchie flat G2 metric close by. And I would think that if you... Uh, argument will tell you for this um, composition I showed you for the schön Calabiao that to have this special Lagrangian vibration you need to be in a specific limit. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, Timo. Oh, okay. About your last point about the incident corrections in presence of D3 brains, yeah. um, I would have thought that when the D3 brain is on top of the M5 instanton, you have those Gana strings, yeah. that you will get a contribution to a different term in the effective action, which depends on the D3 brain moduli. Um, and how would one see which that? Which depends on the D3 brain. So the instanton will then couple to the somehow, right? Right. But I thought How's that, that on the G2 side? On the G2 side, it's a bit complicated. I mean, but, but you can certainly is that you can construct these associatives, you can see what they look like, and then you can see that uh, essentially they are constructed as a sort of string junction. They're constructed very similar to how you would construct string junctions, and somehow you have these string junctions and you have some extra monodromy points, and you bring those extra monodromy points in and they can destroy these junctions. They can, they, I mean, they can essentially, they, they, they have to exist. 
Yeah? But of course, it's difficult to say what is geometrically the new thing that you would get. This I don't know. But that's an interesting question in this context. Yes. This I don't know. Because it's hard. I mean, it's really hard from the G2 side to just say, oh yeah, that's a special Lagrangian. I mean, that's, uh, that's an associative. That's really hard. At least for those ones. There are some that people know about, but these, this type is, is something that uh, is new. All right. Anyone else? Well, if not, let's thank Andres again. And uh, let's welcome.